several factors. We have a serious problem. Håller oljan på att sina? Inte om man får tro oljesjäkerna. Don't worry about. Men priserna stiger. I think it's outrageous. Och snart kan oljeproduktionen börja falla. That day of reckoning is coming and we had better prepare for a transition. Är det någon som vill dölja sanningen? The oil industry. Do you think that they're going to tell their shareholders that they're kind of out of oil? Dokument utifrån ikväll när oljan tar slut. We have to leave oil before oil leaves us. Under de senaste hundra åren har vi byggt en värld som kretsar kring bilen. Den gör att vi kan röra oss fritt över stora avstånd och enkelt transportera allt från mat till möbler. Och med bilen och flyget har vi kunnat kolonisera hela planeten. Men våra 700 miljoner personbilar, lastbilar, flygplan och fartyg vore värdelösa metallklumpar om det inte vore för en sak. Och det är oljan. We came here on oil. Everything around us came to us uh, or is made of oil or oil products. Cheap oil has fueled the biggest party humankind has ever enjoyed. Over the past 150 years, we've done unimaginable things. We've sent people to the moon. We've grown our population over five times. None of this would be possible without this one-time gift from the Earth's geological past. Festen började för 150 år sedan när man först började utvinna olja i Titusville i USA. Men det var Henry Ford och hans populära T-Ford som förvandlade oljan till svart guld. What he accomplished helped men put the burden of work on machines and broke the barriers of space and time. Utvecklingen under 1900-talet gick framåt med stormsteg tack vare de stora oljefälten i USA, Ryssland och Mellanöstern. Bilen blev en nödvändighet och synonym med frihet. Men nu när Kina snart passerar USA som världens största ekonomi så menar en rad branschkännare att oljeproduktionen inte kan hålla jämna steg med efterfrågan utan snart når sitt maximum. Peak oil. It's not that we're running out of oil, it's that the rate at which we can extract that oil is reaching its all-time maximum. And soon the rate of extraction is going to begin to decline and every year thereafter we will have less oil to go around no matter what we do, no matter how many wells we drill, no matter how much money we throw at it. And so we'll have to learn how to live with less oil. De som tror att peak oil snart är här förutspår ödesdigra konsekvenser för världsekonomin. This is an apocalyptic scenario in terms of industrial production, uh, in terms of uh, the food supply, uh, but above all in terms of the transportation system, it cannot continue as we now are. Men många regeringar och statliga och privata oljebolag har en helt annan uppfattning. I believe the concerns about supply disruptions and peak oil are greatly exaggerated. Och inga är mer avvisande till teorin om peak oil än de 13 oljeproducerande länderna i OPEC. Liksom verkställande direktören i världens största oljebolag, Saudi Aramco. The world has more than 140 years of supply at today's current rate of consumption. That fact should discredit the argument that peak oil is imminent. Vem som har rätt har oerhört stor betydelse för oss alla. Tar man en snabb titt på de officiella siffrorna verkar det inte vara något problem. En av de mest använda källorna är BPs årliga statistiska översikt. Den visar att det globalt återstår över en biljon fat olja. Det vill säga ett utbud som räcker i åtminstone 40 år. 
Det sägs att Mellanöstern har över 60 procent av världens oljereserver och OPEC över 80 procent. Men på sistone har det uppstått tvivel om hur mycket olja som faktiskt finns i världen. In terms of the actual reserve estimates, you, you have in many places in the world clear definitions and numbers that you can you can count on. However, in other parts of the world, you have um, you have estimates that are given by by governments that are not audited. And um, whether those estimates are accurate or not is is a key point, particularly as those numbers represent some 80 percent of the world's reserves. Vissa bedömare misstänker att OPEC-länderna överdrev sina reserver mellan 1983 och 1990, och att man fortsatt med det sedan dess. In 1988, for example, suddenly the numbers were increased by 300 billion barrels without the supporting evidence. And there's a suspicion that had to do with quotas and, and it had to, do with, um, had to do with politics. OPEC har alltid förnekat detta. Men under de senaste 20 åren har uppskattningen av reserverna knappt förändrats. Trots att man producerat enorma mängder olja under den tiden. Och det har ytterligare underblåst spekulationen om att reserverna är upplåsta. Det lilla ökenlandet Kuwait antas ha världens fjärde största oljereserv. Här utspelades 1991 Kuwaitkriget sedan Saddam Hussein invaderade landet för att lägga beslag på oljefälten. Men idag stormar de storleken på landets oljereserv. 2006 läcktes hemliga dokument till branschtidningen Petroleum Intelligence Weekly som tycktes visa att oljereserven inte uppgår till de 100 miljarder fat som uppgivits. Ledningen för Kuwaits oljebolag vägrade ställa upp på en intervju men har offentligt förnekat uppgifterna. En före detta parlamentsledamot som var med om att förstatliga oljebolaget var emellertid beredd att uttala sig offentligt. I have seen documents which corroborate the story. The reserves are not uh, 99 billion or 100 billion. The recoverable is between 25 and 35. Flera andra källor kan bekräfta att Kuwaits oljereserv är överskattad. Om det faktiskt stämmer och samma förhållande gäller för hela OPEC så existerar skrämmande nog inte en tredjedel av världens olja. Denna uppfattning har på sistone fått stöd av en tidigare hög chef inom Saudiarabiens oljebolag som anser att OPEX reserver är överskattade med 300 miljarder fat. Men oron över oljetillgången begränsar sig inte till OPEX upplösta reserver. That might be the peak oil plateau 2005 to 2007. Once you get to 208 and 209, it's just steadily deteriorating. Sedan 2002 har föreningen för studiet av Peak Oil tagit på sig uppgiften att upplysa världen om vad man anser vara en hotande katastrof. The main thing you're going to see first is that people will stop using air transport. The next thing people will do is they'll stop commuting, and after that they'll stop eating. Föreningen har nu underavdelningar i över 15 länder och man anser att den globala oljeproduktionen kommer att börja falla de närmaste åren. The regular conventional oil it peaks this year next year or within the next few years and then declines at no more than 2 to 3 percent a year. Det är en speciell faktor som ligger bakom denna oro. The basic problem is that most of the giant fields from which we get the bulk of our crude production were discovered 40 and 50 years ago. Discovery in fact has been declining ever since the mid-60s. The, the, the peak of discovery occurred about 1965. By 1980 uh, the discovery uh, of oil dropped below what we were producing. So for the last 25 years we've been producing and consuming more oil than we've been finding. And that's clearly a situation that can't go on forever, and that's what leads to our fear or our realization and our fear that uh, conventional oil production is going to peak and that we're going to come to a situation where supply can't meet demand. 
Men OPEC menar att de här personerna är domedagsprofeter och att stora mängder olja återstår att upptäcka. Mr. Abdullah Jamal challenged us to find 1 trillion barrels over the next 25 years. That equates to about 40 billion barrels per year. We have not found uh, that much oil in a single year since the 1970s. Why do you think the oil exists? Well, it's a challenge. Uh, the world is underexplored. Uh, new technology is going to go to old fields. I'm not saying we will find it. I'm saying we have to work hard uh, to find it. But absolutely, there is no shortage of oil in the coming 100 to 150 years. Trots att man från saudisk sida målar framtiden i rosenrött så är det uppenbart att oljebolagen börjar skära ner på sin oljeprospektering. Det har varit rapporter av några konsultanter som faktiskt demonstrerar att expenditurer på exploration kan inte vara justifierade på grund av den små mängden av olja som har faktiskt blivit hittat. Så vi ser att vi går till en slags 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 Ändå försöker man verkligen. Globalt borras det efter olja som aldrig förr. Med små riggar som den här. Och med mycket större som den här. Det höga oljepriset gör att riggarna inte räcker till. Men fynden blir allt mindre. Vi used to find elephants and now we find little prairie dogs. När kostnaderna för riggarna går upp så vore det ekonomiskt irrationellt av de stora oljebolagen att fortsätta leta. Trots det stigande oljepriset har gruppen med de fem stora oljebolagen också dragit ner på utgifterna för prospektering de senaste tio åren. Det är långt ifrån situationen under oljeprospekteringens guldålder på 1940-, 50- och 60-talen. in commercial quantities had been brought in after three long discouraging years. Nu när man har utforskat hela planeten går det knappast att hitta mera olja. Det är därför som anhängarna av teorin om peak oil anser att oljeproduktionen kommer att falla. In any area and eventually the world discovery starts and then it declines and production does the same thing after a time lag. Mönstret med allt färre och mindre oljefynd, följt av en fallande produktion, är inte bara en teori, utan har kunnat iakttas i land efter land, inte minst hos världens en gång viktigaste oljeproducent. In the United States, um, we have seen production decline, and we've had uh, we we had peak oil in our country in in the lower 48 anyway, 1980 roughly. 1970. 1970. Thank you. Well, I was within 10 years. That's pretty good for me. Att USA:s oljeproduktion nådde sin topp kring 1970 kom inte som någon överraskning för King Hubbard, den person som förutsagt det 14 år tidigare. That prediction proved to be rather startling and in many cases somewhat distressing. Well, where are we today? So this curve is going on up now. That little peak there is the year 1970. And we've been going down about 5% per year ever since. Produktionstoppen kunde inte ha kommit vid en sämre tidpunkt för USA. Det vill säga kort före Yom Kippur-kriget mellan Israel och Egypten 1973. När arabländerna införde ett oljeembargo som vedergällning för USAs stöd till Israel utlöste man 1970-talets första oljechock. The big Middle East producers cut off oil shipments to major consuming countries. When the embargo was lifted, the price of foreign oil had jumped from 3 to 12 dollars a barrel. Västvärlden drabbades av recession. No one was spared its impact. Efter tre tuffa år bönföll president Carter i ett tv-tal allmänheten att spara energi. With the exception of preventing war, This is the greatest challenge that our country will face during our lifetime. The energy crisis has not yet overwhelmed us, but it will if we do not act quickly. We must not be selfish or timid if we hope to have a decent world for our children and our grandchildren. We simply must balance our demand for energy with our rapidly shrinking resources. 
By acting now, we can control our future instead of letting the future control us. We face a serious energy problem. At the risk of economic blackmail, we import 35% of our petroleum. And even that will be used up in our children's lifetime. We must develop... Mellan 1974 och 1980 spenderade USA miljontals dollar på informationsfilmer och kampanjer för ökad bränsleekonomi och för att få allmänheten att spara energi. Petroleum. It is the challenge of the future. Men 1980 hade det blivit uppenbart att det inte räckte. Mot bakgrund av gisslandramat i Iran och den andra oljechocken var det dags för en ny politik. Let our position be absolutely clear. An attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interest of the United States of America. And such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary, including military force. Oljepriset gick inte bara ner, utan nya oljefyndigheter togs i bruk, bland annat i Nordsjön och i Nigeria. Världen glömde snart bort peak oil. And we just blithely and complacently continue as though nothing has happened. The difference is this time, this is not a cartel of states monopolizing the control of an absolutely scarce and unavoidable commodity. This time it is the final ultimate natural limit on the availability of the resource. This is quite a different circumstance. Men King Hubbard hade inte glömt bort peak oil, utan förutspådde när världen skulle nå sitt produktionsmaximum. The estimated peak would occur about 1995 and we'd go into the decline. Mm -hmm. That assumes an order of evolution. Their OPEC countries are tampering with this curve right now. They're, they're actually curtailing production somewhat. Mm -hmm. And so it's conceivable that this peak up here might be shifted over to the back side a little bit. But it doesn't alter the basic thing that I'm saying significantly. Den prognos som Föreningen för studiet av peak oil gör liknar King Hubbard om man förutspår att peak oil uppnås omkring 2010. There's a lot of debate and discussion whether the peak comes this year, next year, in five years' time. And I think this really misses the point um, because it isn't the peak itself that is of any particular significance. It is the onset of the long decline that follows peak. So there's this huge contrast between the last century or century and a half in which we've seen production growing and now we enter a new world when it begins to decline. Mot bakgrund av det stigande oljepriset vill medierna intervjua oljeministrarna på OPECs huvudkontor i Wien. Frågan gäller om man tänker öka oljeproduktionen. Minister, would an increase put the spare capacity dangerously low? Om produktionen ska öka så menar de flesta bedömare att ökningen måste ske i OPEC-länderna. Whatever incremental barrels we need will have to come from OPEC and within OPEC mainly from the Middle East. OPEC-ministrarna hävdar att deras oljeproduktion inte dras med några problem och att det inte är deras sak att hålla priset nere. Nu när priset är högre än någonsin så är frågan varför OPEC inte ökar produktionen. Men en sak är säker. Saudiarabiens oljeminister tror inte på teorin om peak oil. My opinion of the theory is it is it is uh, what should I say? I think I have called it many different names, <laughs> but don't worry about it. There's nobody else that can actually supply more oil than Saudi Arabia, and they clearly have the only sustainable spare capacity left in the world. What makes that a little bit scary is 
is not those figures, but the fact that 90% of that oil production comes from five very mature fields. They had been using an intense system of water injection to keep the reservoir pressures artificially high, and they're at risk for production collapses coming out of the blue. Simmons' uppfattning att Saudi-Arabiens oljeproduktion kan kollapsa är mycket kontroversiell. Men det kan finnas andra skäl till varför OPEC inte ökar produktionen. Oil is all that they have. When it runs out, what do they, what do they have left? And, and Saudi Arabia, they have a pile of sand, you know. Uh, so they want to stretch out their reserves. Probably the Middle East can keep going at around its present level for another 20, 30 years. But it's not going to increase. And as the other places go down, and they go down because they're forced to go down by, by nature, then that's where the world shortage grows. Under de 150 år som har gått sedan vi började använda olja har världens befolkning mer än fyrdubblats. If you take China and India together, it's two and a half billion people. They consume on average a little bit more than one barrel per person per year. In the industrial world, we consume on average close to 20 barrels per person per year. So you can see huge, huge volumes of oil will be required. Och vårt oljeberoende är enormt. These oil storage tanks hold 1000 barrels. It takes my company about 3 days to produce that much oil. However, the world uses 1000 barrels every second of every day. The real problem is when that demand outstrips the, the ability to get it out of the ground at that pace. That's when the problems begin. Once you reach peak oil, it is a slow process, but it's a gradual but steady uh, reduction. And at the same time, the demand, particularly, of course, China and India, but two-fifths of the total world population, and, of course, other big developing countries, Indonesia, Brazil, etc., as that demand relentlessly rises, some people are going to have to do without. Det är de som kämpar för att få mat för dagen som kommer att drabbas värst. Well, be places in the world that are economically disadvantaged that will not be able to buy very much oil and their people will be hurt significantly. By the same token, the developed countries, the United States, Europe, uh, the other developed countries are going to be hurt very badly because of a huge mortgage that all of a sudden everybody has to pay. Redan nu kan vi börja se följderna av peak oil. I Kina har man börjat ransonera bensinen. Inflationen fortsätter uppåt. Och ekonomierna i Afrikas fattigaste länder har lamslagits av de höga oljepriserna. Vissa bedömare menar att det bara blir värre. Obvious things like um, air travel, holidays in far-flung lands with ridiculously cheap airfares. I mean, that is just going to be out of the window straight away. That won't even be a choice. And I think the standard of living is going to fall for many people. It's very difficult to forecast how this will unfold. Clearly, oil prices will skyrocket because uh, prices very easily can go into the many hundreds of dollars per barrel range. And there will be shortages. Once you realize that this cheap, abundant, easy oil isn't there, that tells you really that virtually every company quoted on the stock market is now overvalued. I, I just can't see any way that we can escape severe economic problems. Um, global depression, I think, is what is going to happen on the balance of probabilities, potentially on the scale of the great stock market crash of October 1929. And what's uh, going to rapidly happen, if it's not happening already, is that it's going to have an impact on food supply. You know, for every calorie of food we consume, we consume on the order of about 10 calories of fossil fuels used in food production and transportation. So it's going to be increasingly the question that people are going to be asking is how are they going to pay for the food and fuel bills? If you're an, an animal living in the wild and it takes you more energy to get your food, then the food will give you, when you eat it, you die. It costs us 
on an average about 10 times as much energy to get our food, to produce our food and transport it to us than the food actually gives us when we eat it. Now how can we possibly do that? Only because of cheap fossil fuels, a one-time gift from nature. And then you've got to ask the appalling question of just how many people the world can support, the planet can support, without the cheap oil that made all this possible. Det finns de som redan har förberett sig för peak oil. Clive, som bor utanför London, har bunkrat förnödenheter som ska räcka i tre månader när krisen kommer. Well, I was just going to show you some of the things that I've collected over the past uh, year or so. Um, under here, I've got a BP solar panel. I have a mains converter in case of power cuts. Okay, so there's the batteries. Just put them in the sunlight, charge them up. There's a water filter in there. I mean, of course, you know, oil makes all sorts of products. So there's medicines. I mean, if we had prolonged shortages or price spikes, most of these things would become more expensive than they are today. And sometimes they may be in shortage themselves. You know, most of our goods are brought in from the Far East or China. Uh, you know, what would happen with, with sort of long distance transportation? I've got a Sony portable radio there. This is quite useful. Right, okay, this is the uh, small room. It's just sort of tinned, tinned food. More potatoes. I've got some camping gear to cook it with. You've got chili con carne there. We don't really know how far the price is going to rise, and it's going to impact us in all areas of our lives. It's not just how much it costs to fill up your car on the forecourt. Oil is used in food production, say. All of our furniture and most of our electronic items are purchased from around the world. So the prices of those goods, those luxury items, uh, is going to rocket. That probably wraps it up for, you know, flat and what I have. We are losing the framework of our humanity. Men vid en oljekonferens i Rimini i Italien där Sharon Stone var specialinbjuden gäst så verkade inte chefen för US Energy Information Administration tycka att det fanns något att oroa sig för. We have a fairly steady growth outlook for uh, oil and natural gas uh, supply and demand over the next 20 years. Our latest forecast includes uh, growth from about 84 million barrels a day in 2005 to about 120 million barrels a day by 2025. Deras prognos talar om peak oil omkring 2037. Hur är det möjligt? The best way to affect the current price of gasoline is to encourage uh, producing nations to put more crude oil on the market. Tanken är att hälften ska komma från OPEC och den andra hälften. The best way to break this addiction is through technology. Technology continues to show improvement in the ability to produce in depths of water more than uh, 6,000 feet, going into into zones through horizontal drilling and the increasing the uh, recovery rate. Om han har rätt, inträffar peak oil först om 30 år, och då finns det gott om tid att hitta alternativ. Thank you, Andrew. Thank Under de senaste 150 åren har oljebolagen lämnat kvar mycket olja under marken. Att pumpa upp återstoden är vad många sätter sitt hopp till. Today we can maybe produce between 33 percent, 40 uh, of the oil that we found. That means we have left a lot of oil in the ground, and just to raise it by one or two percent will make all the difference in the world. Inte långt från platsen där Edwin Drake borrade den första oljekällan gör Arthur Stewart sig en god förtjänst på att utvinna olja ur gamla oljekällor. This oil was drilled 100 years ago. Back then the underground pressure was so intense that it lifted thousands of barrels to the surface from each of these wells. Now today that pressure is depleted. In order to extract oil we're using a technology called fracturing. We're injecting water and sand under great pressure to break open the rock that contains the oil underground. Fracturing is one of the more effective technologies used in the oil industry today 
and it allows us to reach isolated pockets of oil and thereby increase our recoverable reserves. But it is utterly ludicrous to think that technology will increase production to the levels that existed in the heyday of this oil field. Samma sak gäller i Kilgore i östra Texas. Här ligger USA:s näst största oljefält. Och det var här man utvann en stor del av oljan som möjliggjorde de allierade seger i andra världskriget. Här arbetar Jeffrey Brown med att utvinna den återstående oljan. No matter what the drilling rate, no matter what technology we use, we've not been able to reverse the long-term decline. Men det är inte bara dåliga nyheter. På vissa håll har produktionen tidigare varit så ineffektiv att man skriker efter den senaste tekniken. When, when I was in Russia working with Yugos, we felt like many of the fields that had official recovery factors of 30% could be moved up to 40 to 45%. But there is a physical limit to how much oil you can get out of the rocks. En ökad oljeutvinning sker normalt mot slutet av ett oljefälts livslängd och det påverkar bara i begränsad omfattning tidpunkten för peak oil. Additions and extensions of giant fields will stretch out the period before the day of reckoning, but they will not put it off forever. Sure, it's in certain fields, there is a higher recovery can be achieved, and you know all kinds of technical things can be done. The main impact of all of that will make the tail a bit longer and a bit higher, but peak itself is driven by the cheap, easy stuff. Och hur är det med annan teknik? Många experter menar att den inte har så stor betydelse. Well, you can find a number of people who think that new technology is going to be the salvation for us in the future. And I think that if we look at the history of the United States, where we peaked in oil in 1970, when you think about the technological advances that have occurred since that time. Det har gjorts enorma framsteg inom prospekterings- och borrteknik. Och så har vi den digitala revolutionen. All of those incredible technological advances, the U.S. oil has declined. Det är inte första gången som oljeindustrin har hosat tekniken. Technology moves forward. We have new techniques, better seismic, new ways to look below the ground in addition to the drill bit. Redan för 30 år sedan stod det klart att ny teknik inte nödvändigtvis skulle göra någon skillnad. There's more digging for oil and gas than at any time in recent years and less success in finding them. Compared to 1973, nearly twice as many drilling rigs are working the country's oil and gas field. But the effort is not paying off as it used to. The rate of new oil discovery last year was 35% below 1973. Ny teknik behöver inte vara någon större hjälp när det gäller att hitta nya oljefyndigheter. Men det har gjort att oljebolagen kunnat utvinna Nordsjöoljan snabbare så att vinsterna kunnat maximeras. Only the better you do the job, the sooner it's over. So Britain peaked in 1999. Production is falling at about 6% a year if not more. It may be increasing their production some or at least reducing the decline. I do not believe though that it has the possibility of, of preventing peak oil. Men det finns en teknik som faktiskt gör skillnad. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not saying that new technology will not add reserves. For example, we're out in uh, uh, 3000, 4000, 6000 feet of water in the Gulf of Mexico, deep water Brazil, uh, offshore um, uh, Nigeria. No doubt whatsoever that new technology has enabled production in that deep water to be brought to market. Yes, new technology can. Prospektering på djupt vatten utanför Brasilien och i Mexikanska golfen är det stora hoppet för oljeindustrin. Borrfartygen är fantastiskt avancerade och de flesta stora oljefynd under senare år har gjorts med hjälp av dessa riggar. New discoveries in deep water offshore, absolutely. This This adds to the known base of resource. That's such a small percentage that it doesn't help very much. Oljeproduktionens utveckling i USA är ett bra exempel på att offshore utvinning kan göra skillnad om en inte tillräckligt stor. I det här diagrammet kan man se hur offshore utvinningen dämpar den nedåtgående trenden, men efter 1985 tar nedgången fart igen. The offshore has been 
uh, a disappointment, and many of us believe that the offshore uh, global picture will peak very soon in terms of production. Uh, we are facing a serious threat. This in the we can hit a wall within the next seven, eight years of time, even if we slow down the oil demand growth. Even if we get additional oil growth from the United States or in Europe from the rather smaller fields, we will not be able to extend the lifetime of oil for a very long time. We have to put a lot of money and in research and development to, um, uh, to get energy, new energy technologies in place to be able to uh, replace oil with alternative fuels and technologies because uh, I believe uh, we have to leave oil before oil leaves us. But the difficulty is transportation sector, it is very difficult to find alternatives to oil. So, and this is, I believe, this is the Achilles heel of our society, that the oil demand is focusing only on transportation sector where you have almost no viable, uh, easy alternatives. Den största överraskningen är inte vad han säger, utan att han, till skillnad från de flesta ekonomer, inte tycks anse att marknaden kan lösa våra energiproblem. Supply and demand always match. There is, by definition, no difference. Uh, and so they always match. So, you know, we have a lot of problems about, you know, supply shortage and stuff like that. But it's amazing what happens. Uh, when uh, the reality has come. The Pico paranoia is based on geology. The real issues have to do with economics and politics. Economics and politics. Who should invest, when they should invest, how much should they invest, in what way, under which type of contract, etc. The economists don't accept this limit. They say, well, if you want more oil, why don't you drill more wells? It, they, from their point of view, it is simply a matter of investment. So if you want more oil out of the North Sea, well, raise the price, invest more in it, and more will come out. They just cannot understand that there ain't anything there. När oljepriset nådde 100 dollar fatet hade tidningarna rena julafton, men få talade om peak oil. Anledningen är att de flesta analytiker tror att mer olja blir tillgänglig när priset går upp. Därför så är ett högre pris inte nödvändigtvis negativt. One reason why people like us economists actually think it's a good thing is it encourages us to conserve energy. It also makes a lot of alternative and additional sources of energy more financially viable. If you assume that the price of oil was going to be $20 a barrel for the next 50 years, actually we're getting quite close to the peak of global oil production. But if you assume it's $75, suddenly you push that kind of day of reckoning way out. There's no money trading mechanism in existence. You can find oil that God didn't put there. And the price isn't going to increase that amount of oil. People hope for the best and confuse uh, a, a, an assessment of reality with, with what they would happen. The economists who don't know their physics and pay no attention to them live in a fairy tale land and are telling people, oh, don't worry, economic incentives will cause new technologies to come in. That, that is just absolutely absurd. And I think they will be looked at in the future as really bad guys. Prismekanismen och marknaden är vad den brittiska regeringen sätter sitt hopp till. Man avvisar teorin om peak oil och säger världens olje- och gastillgångar räcker för att upprätthålla tillväxten för överskådlig tid. Men är den närmast religiösa tron på prismekanismen bara en avancerad form av självbedrägeri? To try to deal with what would happen in the case of peak oil requires an enormous amount of effort um, and it's easier to deal with day-to-day -day sort of problems than it is to deal with with long-term problems um, the second point is that there are enormous vested interests in the current status quo jimmy carter was ridiculed because he pointed to this problem. Politicians ought not prematurely to point to a big threat. They get ridiculed. When Churchill pointed to the Nazi threat in the 1930s, he was ridiculed. It's much easier for a politician to, to react to a crisis than to foresee one. I mean, they don't launch the lifeboats till the ship is low in the water, you know. 
And there's nothing new about this. Look at the events leading up to the Second World War. I mean, anyone with eyes could see it coming, and yet they did their very best to evade the issue till the troops were at the door. I think it was Churchill who said, trust the people. People are perfectly capable of using their minds to come to rational conclusions. But government has to be open enough and honest enough to allow that to happen. I USA har ett bensinpris på 3 dollar per gallon, olja för 100 dollar fatet och Irakkriget fått politiker att vara uppmärksamma risken för peak oil. A significant number of petroleum geologists believe that in this decade and perhaps already we have reached global peak oil production, something that happened in 1970 in America where half of all the oil that we can get out of the ground has been taken out, most of it in the last 60 years. Och i slutet av 2007 så började till och med president Bush inse vad klockan är slagen. I believe oil prices are going up because the demand for oil outstrips the supply for oil. Uh, oil is going up because developing countries uh, still use a lot of oil. Oil is going up because we use too much oil. And the capacity to replace reserves is dwindling. That's why the price of oil is going up. Men visst måste det finnas en lösning. Varför inte satsa på elbilar? In the longer term we will electrify this. I think there's very little question about that and there are a number of things that we can electrify. Why can't we do it right away because we have all of those cars and all of those trucks, light duty trucks, heavy duty trucks and all of that industry out there that has long physical life and you can't just trash it overnight. Men de flesta människor jorden runt kommer inte att ha råd med elbilar under överskådlig tid. Och även om de hade det, var skulle all elektricitet komma ifrån? Idealet är förnyelsebar energi. All these renewables are technically feasible, but I think the, the lead time to go to a point where renewables are, are actually accounting for 20 to 30 percent of our energy supply. You can't measure it in 5 or 10 years. I think you're measuring it in 20 to 30. Years. Så elbilar kommer att dröja. Men det finns två andra alternativ, båda med sina speciella problem. The easiest near-term solution is is shifting to um, to natural gas. You don't have to change your basic energy systems, and um, the supply of natural gas is far more abundant than the supply of oil right now. Plugs in here. Även om tekniken finns för en övergång till naturgas inom transportsektorn så blir det inte lätt. Perhaps the natural gas reserves are a bit bigger than uh, oil but uh, they are still limited and uh, they are concentrated in countries uh, where it is not very easy to get the gas out. What the Persian Gulf is to oil, um, Russia is to gas. And um, there needs to be a very serious dialogue between Russia and the rest of the world to make this gas strategy work. Det går också att framställa olja ur kol och de enorma fyndigheterna av kärsand i Kanada och Venezuela. Vissa tror att det är de som kommer att rädda oss från peak oil. Oil production peaks. There, there is a lot of oil uh, in the world. There really is. Uh, and, and, and I think these uh, stories of uh, peak oil and shortage just, just aren't right. I mean, I was up in Canada but the other day looking at what was happening on the heavy oil, the tar sands there. Uh, and really, the, the resources are infinite. Och Lord Brown har rätt. Man kan framställa stora mängder olja ur kärsanden. Men enligt många bedömare så är det väldigt svårt. It is still uh, very expensive. And second, in order to uh, produce oil from tar sands, you have to put a lot of energy inside. And uh, in this case, it is, for example, in the uh, gas, which is used, natural gas. Nobody, nobody involved with the thing at all does other than explain the difficulties of doing it, the immense processing that has to go on, and the forecasts of production rising are probably quite reasonable. Oil sands production is growing from a million barrels this year to probably three million barrels a day by uh, 2015, but that's a drop in the bucket. 
Och att framställa olja ur världens enorma kolfyndigheter lär också det bli väldigt svårt. As far as building coal to liquid plants very rapidly it can be done. As far as building gas to liquid plants it can be done very quickly. It just requires that we marshal resources in a way that hasn't been done since the Second World War. På kort sikt finns det två alternativ. Antingen börjar vi spara energi och inriktar oss på en framtid med låg energiförbrukning. Eller så framställer vi olja ur kol och kärsand och riskerar vår miljö. But the implications are clear. It means if we don't change, we'll either burn up the planet or go broke and they might both happen at the same time. We ought to be preparing now, but we're not going to do it. There is public awareness, there is not Uh, a cry from politicians who generally don't like to be associated with bad news uh, to begin to change our way. If you look at the policy makers in Washington and London and Moscow and all around the world, this is not on their radar screen. They've not been imagining what life could be like without oil. And that's the task for us now. Nästa vecka. Presidentvalet i USA närmar sig efter en lång och jämn kampanj. Men vilka är de egentligen? Vad har de åstadkommit? Vad vill de? Se den amerikanska miniserien om John McCain och Barack Obama. Vägen till Vita huset. Start i dokument utifrån om en vecka.